you know, curiosity and bargaining and negotiating, that's just normal. I guess because I was terrible at, in school and, and never went to college and didn't go like the whole full path, that stuff, you know, it wasn't knocked out of me. Uh, I guess many people that say, oh, I could never be an entrepreneur. They might be like, you know, maybe they could have been. But throughout their lives, they got that so mitigated, so put in the in the back burner that they lost touch with it. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a we surprise so outbreak is the issue of pandemic. No social distancing at all. They, they said that they would express their concerns um, about so the mask supply. Where's the mask? Where's the glove? A second wave is we all need some good news. People. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. From Santa Rosa, California, this is 19 Stories. I'm Cheryl Holling. My guest, Fernando Pires, describes himself as fundamentally a problem solver with a remarkable ability to learn and then implement his newfound knowledge. A relentless entrepreneur, engineer, and musician who has created a total of five patents and founded two companies in the decade between 2008 and 2018 creating and providing amazing consumer electronics for podcasters, voiceover artists, musicians, and car audio enthusiasts. Fernando was originally born and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and thanks to his current employer, Kicker, sponsored him to become a permanent U.S. resident in 2016. He now proudly calls the U.S. his home. He is also the creator and president of Audio Sigma, that produces the Pod Mobile, an ultra portable audio recording interface designed specifically for podcasters and voice actors. Although they are a small startup company, their minds are set to grow into a brick and mortar business where people not only work, but feel as though they are part of his extended family. Highly inspired by Steve Irby, the founder of Kicker, a business that's been thriving for over 50 years, Fernando plans to do the same thing with his company. As if being a full-time employed engineer, creator, and president of your own company wasn't enough, Fernando also self-published Jumpstart, a short, sweet, and to-the-point book designed to jumpstart your life now while working on your dreams for the future. Fernando's work ethic is the ground upon which he builds any endeavor. And he strongly believes that education can come from multiple sources. And when skills meet genuine good intentions, progress happens. Let's meet Fernando Pires by welcoming him to 19 Stories. Hi, Cheryl. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing so well. And I always like to begin my conversations with my guests by talking about their origins. And I mentioned Kicker in your intro. Mm -hmm. So... I would love it if you could share more about what kind of company they are and how you managed to get from Sao Paulo, Brazil to Stillwater, Oklahoma. <laughs> That's a story. I mean, how long is the podcast? <laughs> With how you endured our technical difficulties, we can pack a lunch, a dinner. I don't know if we'll have listeners after that, but we can. Okay, you, so I'm going to order some pizza now <laughs> just in case, you know, because okay. if I get hungry midway through this. Kicker, literally, they changed my life because, you know, they sponsored me to come from Sao Paulo, Brazil to the U.S. and therefore Stillwater. That's where their headquarters is. I mean, literally, I, I can walk there. Yeah, Steve, he founded this company 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago. I think it's amazing that he didn't move to any other location, you know, and literally like he amassed uh, so much, you know, wealth with his business and all, but didn't change. And he's the same, if not, honestly, if, if that had any effect in his personality, it only was for the better. So, you know, he stayed in Stillwater and he's, you know, really community oriented person. And this is a wonderful place to live. Like the university is awesome here. People are just about the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. And lo and behold, I've been here for seven years and, and loving every, every year, honestly. And to your point, the way this came about was an amazing, was an amazing story. As far as timing goes, is literally divine. So it was the end of 2014. And I had been uh, working like obsessively since 2005, 2006 as an entrepreneur. And what I did is that I, I created a bunch of uh, different audio products like uh, portable uh, mixers, sound effects, amplifiers, and things of that nature. And 
I I spent all my money doing that. Literally, like I had no money for myself whatsoever. All the money went into parts and, and tools. And it sounds great, but it got to a point that it was a very dire situation, really. And some of those projects, I managed to get all the money back by selling the products in the market. And by that, I mean going on online and selling them myself and putting on the mail and, and negotiating with each and every customer separately, supporting warranty and all that. It was an uphill battle. So I kept recycling that money. So this project, then that project, then the next project. And I didn't have the right advice. And I, I think even if I had had the right advice, I probably wouldn't hear anyway. So I'm not going to blame that on anything else or anyone else. But I started off with a project that was way, way beyond my capability at the time to build them. So it was this unit that it's beautiful. It's it's like, honestly, it's just g- gorgeous and it works great with brushed aluminum and silver car paint. It's just this really nice little amplifier for musicians. and But it required more than 300 parts to build one. 300 and, parts? Yeah, like all <laughs> circuit boards and tons of parts on those circuit boards. And it was like super advanced. And that, that was in 2007 when I designed it and I started selling it in 2008. And, you know, I had this little math worked out that I needed to pump out 28 units a month to have cash flow. What happened is that the supply chain didn't work one bit. So I needed to make inventory in like all the parts. I needed to have them in two months to three months. And everything checked with the suppliers. They all said, yeah, we'll have it for you in 20 days. So I thought it was okay. But, you know, the truth is that I had a lot of suppliers for multiple different things and no redundancy. Like if I cannot get from this guy, I can go to the other person. There was no such thing. And uh, oh, wow. And with yeah. 300 parts, that's yeah. you're, you're really putting your livelihood in the hands of a lot of people. Right. There was no such thing as my livelihood, though. Like I was 20. <laughs> Uh, okay. You know, well, like I was living with my I, I meant mom. The life, the life of your product. my mom, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I literally owe her everything. <laughs> so, you know, I, I could take any risks, but I was I was so freaking dedicated to this. It was ridiculous. I was living and breathing this 100%. And, you know, it was awful when nothing worked. And uh, it took nine months to fill up the inventory. And of course, the cash flow was calculated by having someone hire, like I was going to hire two people to help me build those units. So it would be like the three of us basically putting things together. So as the cash flow would never work, I didn't hire them. I built all those units myself. They had a bunch of difficulties to build. Like it was a good thought out product to use, but it was the dumbest thing to build. Like it was so difficult. So that's just one example of how it failed. So I failed that way. That was the first way I failed and then came up with a bunch of different things. And they never really succeeded financially. The products were good. People were happy to buy them, but they didn't bring me either enough money or I was at a loss. Ultimately, I developed a a car DSP and that car DSP was incredibly advanced. Developed a car? Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have explained. There's a technology called DSP, which stands for Digital Signal Processing. You know, those circuit boards for that has equalizers and things like that, a bunch of knobs, and you can make things sound better, essentially. Imagine if a little tiny chip the size of your thumbnail, actually smaller than that, could do a lot better than that. Just incredible, totally revolutionary technology. And um, I learned that, which is a different chapter in that story. I tried to get a scholarship that (laughs) never got that scholarship because my grades were bad, but then I learned it myself and I created this product. And then I tried to outsource the manufacturing. Actually, I even, I tried to partner up with someone with a company that would pay me royalties for it or like buy the project outright. And unfortunately that project fell in the wrong hands. And oh, yeah, it was a total loss. And end of 2014, it was basically rock bottom because I had been recycling that money from project to project for years. And then it, it got to that point, I basically lost everything. And I had $2,000 to my name. That was 2014, end of 2014. Then the only thing left I had to sell was basically my, my skill set. And the Which way sounds I wanna... like at this point, if I might add, phenomenal with everything that you had to teach yourself. Yes, it was actually. And it was a very unique set of skills because 
I never went to school. I never went to college. And when you do, that's great. But the more you do it and the more you specialize, now you get more like skilled at one thing, but then you miss other things. Things might be different now. So I just don't want to say that this is the case always, but at least it was the case in Brazil at that time. But if I were to go to college, you know, I would learn this and not that and and also not that, so to speak. So I accumulated this wealth of knowledge of from coding to circuit board design and a lot of practical knowledge and a lot of literally like skilled ability to build those prototypes with teeny tiny parts and solder each one of them. Like those are like smaller than ants. And that, like that is remarkable to me. It's almost like a surgeon for you to be able to work in that yeah, small yeah. space. We're not talking about something that had 300 parts to this, right? This is very different than what you were dealing with before, correct? You mean you mean the current audio interfaces that I make? Yeah. Totally yeah. different. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they have a bunch of parts, but I get the, the circuit boards pre-assembled. And, you know, then it, it doesn't take anywhere near as much time as I see. it would have okay. otherwise. And, and now I have uh, factoring taxes that I've been quoting with. And uh, hopefully it will be the case it will be 100% manufacturing in the U.S., just to clarify, though, for our listeners, you're referencing Pod Mobile now, or you're referencing the work that you're doing for Kicker? Yeah, that's a great question. I just referenced Pod Mobile, but the stuff that I do for okay. Kicker is actually similar in some aspects. Oh, okay. Like I, I build the prototypes for them. You know, I do circuit design for them. I do uh, coding for them. Uh, the difference is that they they have a wonderful manufacturing. Like their suppliers are amazing and high volume. But of course, I don't get to do any of my own business. That's completely detached from from kicker so there's a clear cut line there but and that you know, makes back, sense yeah yeah and you know the the greatest thing about it is that the owner steve he is he's fine with this you know he doesn't have a problem with me having my own business quite the opposite he's actually supportive and i ask permission for him sometimes hey can i use your test fixture to uh, measure the performance of my audio interface at your lab and he always says yes which is remarkable you know he that is amazing yeah, it is. He's a very generous person. He's actually helping me out of my own job. That's basically against their interest, but um, and that's you know, just very rare. That's and usually yeah, if if yeah. they see that you're that good and have that aptitude, it's right. not really encouraged because they don't want to lose a good employee. You know that is that is the case. However, that's the kind of person he is. You know, that's, that's uh, he's wonderful. Basically, the yeah one of the most admirable people I've ever met in my life. Steve is certainly the first. Yeah, huge thumbs up and such a role model. So all these difficulties with projects and then the last project didn't really uh, work out at all. It fell in the wrong hands. They had this DSP technology that I mentioned, which was awesome. Each one of these projects added a bunch of knowledge to my skill set and basically added no money to my account. But those skills were desirable. So end of 2014, I was at rock bottom and honestly desperate. Like, really, because I have no college and when things are not going well and you don't have a degree, it freaks you out. So mm -hmm. now it's cool to say, oh, I never went to school. I'm self-taught. But when things were bad, it was the worst thing. And honestly, we never know tomorrow. So if things get bad again, I'll be, you know, feeling like vulnerable again. Just something that whenever I mention that I'm self-taught, people generally think is, is a cool thing. That's kind of a word of caution. It's a riskier and harder path, that's for sure. So wealth of knowledge and $2,000. And I was desperate. I had like a moment that I thought, okay, what is it going to be? Is the situation going to own me or am I going to own the situation? And it was, it was kind of a switch flipped. And then I had an idea of putting together a video curriculum, so to speak, because if I were to write a you know, CV, it would have been laughable because it would have been just high school. And, you know, I could put some projects there and stuff, but it was just ridiculous. I didn't even have college for my education was stopped there. And uh, if I were to send this to HR, they would have not even pay any attention whatsoever to it. If I may interject for American audiences, most people refer to it as a resume, but CV mm -hmm. is, is referenced usually outside of the States. I just wanted to clarify that. Perfect. Thank you, Cheryl. That's helpful. So put together this video resume and for each thing that I would write in a normal resume, instead of writing, oh, uh, I know this software or I know how to do this. Instead, I in the video, I showed myself using the software or brilliant. building the circuit board. That's yeah. brilliant. So it was literally like what you see is what you get, mm -hmm. you know? So I put together this video and that's 
you know, end of 2014, that's almost 10 years ago. So it wasn't commonplace that people would do that. Maybe today people are doing that more. Oh, yeah, it was, sure. Yeah, it was very unique at the time. And it had this really awesome music in the background makes, you know, you, you stomp your feet. And it was entertaining. It was engaging. It was accelerated. It was just cool to watch, regardless of whether you're understanding what's going on or not. I sent that video to a few companies in the U.S. and in Brazil. And lo and behold, Kaker replied in three hours. And three, then really? Three hours. And then... That, that is remarkable. I know. It's wild. And then I had Power Base which was Image Dynamics at the time, they reached out to me as well. Diamond Audio reached out to me as well. So three reputable companies in the US and uh, one company in Brazil, Sound Digital. They're amazing. They're kicking butt. You know, they are they have strong presence in the, in the US. They export a lot to Europe. So it could be a great career there too. I was overwhelmed because one day, literally like one night, I was just like, oh my God, is this it? You know, like totally in desperate shape. And the next thing I know, I have all these opportunities and was basically overwhelmed by the, you know, the amount of choice, which... Yeah, you know, to have choices all of a sudden. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good problem, but it's a problem. Yes, it <laughs> but the way I went about it was really like straightforward. You know, like honestly, what I did was I wrote to everybody the same email, thanking them a bunch. Inside, I was like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> same but, but in the email... But you're was, very <laughs> calm. Yeah, and they're like good. super yes. well composed, okay? Of course. Yeah. So. You can put food on the table now. Yeah. So, you know, on, on the email, it was like flawless grammar and just like never really showing any sign of desperation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And almost bragging like, oh, you know, I have some other opportunities that I also need to look at. But into you did. Life. That's the cool thing. You did. <laughs> I know. Like now, now I'm like wanted, right? <laughs> but anyhow. Kicker were the first to reply, so I prioritized them to be my first priority because mm. they were the first. And plus, I knew that they've been in, in business forever. And honestly, like it's hard to be in business if you do weird stuff, right? So, oh yeah, for fifty years, and yeah, and, no, that just doesn't work, right? I have to ask you: Had you ever been to Oklahoma prior to responding to them? Well, I was going to say no, but uh, I've been in Mississippi before. That's a That's different not the story. Same. And uh, I passed the job that I was offered uh, in Mississippi. It was a great job, great company. But I was 21 or 22 at the time. So I, I knew I could still afford risk. I had no children. I don't have children, to be clear, not yet. I passed on that. And my family was like, are you nuts? Like, you, you like, you're such in such a bad shape. You have all this pile of you know, parts just laying around. You're crazy to pass on this. And I did. But you knew. You obviously knew in your heart that wasn't the one I knew it was like, I just had one more shot after that one. So I could afford to skip that one opportunity. I didn't feel in my heart at all. That was actually a very hard no to say. But I prioritized Kicker. And the person who contacted me, now my supervisor, he asked me a really smart question. He said, okay, so you can do all those things, but to what level can you do them? Mm. basically like rate yourself on yeah each that's one a of good those question because it was a, an extensive resume you know like and i was like oh my goodness and then i gave him like a really straight answer i said look i can't rate myself on these things because you know my reference might be different from your reference i don't know what kind of engineers you work with on a daily basis and quite honestly it's hard for me to gauge myself when i work alone you know that's what i did the whole time that's really forthright. That's honest. How can you gauge yourself right. when you're a solopreneur, so to speak? Basically, right? Like a one-man band. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So I said, look, here's what I can do. Let me build you a prototype from scratch for you guys, and then I'll ship it to you. And then you tell me what's my skill level. Wow. Right. And then that, I had to, th- wow. like, keep, keep this in mind, I had 2000 bucks, all right? So uh-huh. that prototype cost me 1400 <gasps> You are a risk taker. I love it. I love it. It's, you know, okay. I, I don't think so. Like, maybe I take risks that are worthwhile. If it, it could be a very little risk, could be like 0.1% chance of going wrong. But if it's not a worthy risk, I don't take it. Mm. So I take mm-hmm. worthy risks, good risks. Calculated. Uh, sure. Yes. And, you know, eight times out of 10, I always have a plan B. Not always. But anyhow, I built this thing. And I shipped to them and I didn't hear a word for 10 straight days. And I was like turning green already. Then 10 days later, his next email was a one-liner. How can I go to Brazil to interview you? I'm like, okay, this is probably good. (laughs) Okay, so he didn't say, how can we get you here for an interview? He literally wanted to pursue you and come to Brazil. 
that you know that was surprising to me that and is I'm amazing like, fernando the, do you the, realize at that at first like my my the way i felt about that email at first was like he didn't even make a single comment on the circuit board or anything oh, so what do you think that was that was the comment like I, it was for like... a second i thought is there something like wrong with it but then i'm like if he's willing to get overseas like travel for 10 hours more, actually. That means some. Anyhow, well, yeah. we, we, talk, we <laughs> talked on a Thursday. And I said, look, you need a visa to get to Brazil. And da 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 da, da. Not super easy. But I do have a tourist and business visa. I had at that time, B1, B2. And I could go visit you guys. Well, they booked me a flight for Sunday that same week. So it was Thursday and the flight was booked for Sunday. And all I did was to um, just drive to the airport, park my car there and get on that flight. And then I had the this four day long job interview. And it went really well. It I'd say out so, because history is showing you that it did yeah. go well. <laughs> My skill set was perfect for them. I didn't know that at the time that I sent that video to them. Their engineer had passed, unfortunately. So he was a really good guy, a really good engineer, and he had passed. And and then I contacted them. That's when I said that's why I said it was divine timing as well. Timing, it was just, yes. Yeah, it was it was incredible, right? I also considered the other offers. Uh, one in particular was very tempting because I was going to work remotely. The exchange rate is such, like the currency exchange rate, that if I if I was making like say 80k a year, you know, at first, it would be like amazing in Brazil, like it would be times five. But something in me said, this is not the right way. You know, this is not what you should do. Take the harder path, take the harder path. I tried to negotiate with Kicker to work remotely. Uh, at the time, I was not fond of the idea of leaving Sao Paulo, leaving Brazil. Um, sure. I wanted to stay there, but they said, look, uh, we're a team here and uh, we, we need you here, but we'll take care of you. I said, yeah, okay. So as long as all the documentation, all is, you know, taken care of by you guys. And and they did that. You know, I got my my green card just two years later. So they got a, the working visa and then two years later, the, the green card. And they had me put some skin in the game as well, but they paid basically at least 80% of this process, which was like 20 grand. They totally had my back. They totally had my back. And uh, and then the first couple of years were hard. And uh, there was a, a moment that I, I wanted to go back and, and just, you know, basically just quit. Was it the adjustment that w- what was hard about that? Well, first off is that um, my friends and my distractions and my family, they were nowhere near. And then figuring out everything, like really what brand of canned beans do I buy? Like, you know, (laughs) yeah, I mean, no, well, seriously, even if you move to another state within the states, which I have, I've lived in the South, but not in Oklahoma. I live in Tennessee and it is different. You have to acclimate Mm -hmm. to to everything. So uh, besides culturally, which is almost a given, and I have a question about that, too. I didn't know if it was hard on the job in that you underestimated or overestimated your situation. But it sounds like the job was solid. It was a matter of settling into your life that was So so this is what happened. Okay. One thing that didn't help is that I came here with $200, you know, so I spent 1400 out of the 2000, then I had 600. Then by the time I got here, I had 200 and uh, the salary came in 45 days later, the first payment. Yeah. So, but you know, people had me over for dinner, for for breakfast, for lunch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, my supervisor allowed me to borrow the money from him to pay the first rent, which I paid him back, of course. But I didn't have a car for five and a half months. And that was like the peak of the summer. Oh, wow. So, you know, oh, like I, I was no going more. to work uh, and I was kind of embarrassed to walk in the office with a sweaty shirt. Yeah, it was it was not easy. And there was also an issue of rivality, rivality. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I was very different in the way I operated. Right. I And thankfully, I am the same person. I didn't change. But at that time, my personality would not fit in that group at all. So you had people that had all the diplomas and stuff and and they felt, uh, I don't know, um, threatened. M- Perhaps I was cranking, you know, I, I had a point to prove my whole life was work. I mean, literally, at that point, my whole life was work. So my life was going to Kaker, going to Walmart, going to the gym, going home on my bicycle. That was it. So I, I you know, I became a punch bag for a while. And um, it, it, it that was that was rough. And that was what motivated me to really learn a lot more about human behavior and psychology and things like that, because I, I needed to understand what was going on. And as the more the more I understood what was going on, the better I could deal with it. The exercising, um, really, just going to the, to the gym and lifting uh, weights, 
uh, helped everything brain chemistry uh self-confidence and all that so that was that was good i very quickly got all my stuff together finances and all so it was grueling the first two years i remember christmas was i i love christmas like honestly I, I, once I, I had been asked the question if you could only celebrate one of the two your birthday or christmas which one would you pick i would certainly pick christmas yeah me too me too <laughs> you know that's so cool isn't it mm -hmm. and um and i hated christmas because i it, i was stuck here and you couldn't you know, be with your family meet. and friends right right it was bad it was really bad the first two years but you know i made it home here i'm so glad this whole thing went down the way it did once when i was like super close to quitting the owner of kicker which is a great friend of mine today we play music together with you know we're actually good friends he was uh, worried about me my person and he came up to me and asked what was going on we, we had like breakfast together and we talked and i'm a very good person i mean i can read people's intentions and body language very quickly if somebody's lying i can tell from a distance and that was nothing nothing there was not an inch of self-interest in, in him doing that like i'm about to lose this person who you know uh is skilled or projects depend on him or whatever he was there because he was generally worried i appreciated it and he said you know the way is through the fire it's not around the fire and uh and that Ooh, was honestly that's his good opinion. That's yeah, good. right. Repeat that. Repeat that. that he that's said good. that the way is through the fire, not around the fire. On the fire. That's good. Yeah. Well, I took a deep breath and I'm like, you know, this, 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 this is a great person. And if it wasn't for him doing that that day, I would have left and I would have gone work for that company in Brazil. Today, I have a completely different perspective. And the whole deal about through the fire changed a lot of things in me, changed my priorities, changed. I mean, I always had work ethic, but I didn't necessarily have had the right ideas in mind, especially when it came to family and relationships and, and things like that. And God has put me here and I thank him for the influence of wonderful men in my life. Men, they are generally amazing and very successful. That's just a product of who they are, but their strength of character, they're just, you know, loyal, truthful, slow to anger, just wonderful man. And, you know, with good kids, good marriages and, and all that. And, you know, looking back, the man that I was around when I was in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I mean, from family and friends, except with my grandpa, my grandpa always loved him. And I thought he was amazing. They were not, they were not at all good man. Uh, I was trying to be better than that in some sense. But, you know, I didn't have references and I did not have proof that being a good man works, you know, basically. Yeah, you had no role model. Totally. Like it, it looked like I knew that wasn't true, so I was not going that, that way, but um, I didn't have proof to my hunch, so to speak, that being a good person actually is a good idea, uh, like in terms of being successful in the world in worldly terms, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. sure. status and, sure. and finances and all that. And here I had more than enough. So Stillwater, Oklahoma, it's been, uh, you know, who would have thought, right? Well, that's, nice why I, that's why yeah. I was wondering, culturally, such a change. And and I just got to yes. say, first of all, kudos to you for having the tenacity and strength to, to dig deep. Because usually any new endeavor, whether it's starting your own business or a new job, they say give it two years or moving to a place. Mm -hmm. Give it two years. Right, right. And when you're in the midst of those two years, if they're good, it goes by in a blink. But if they're mm -hmm. tough, it's yeah. really easy to go, what did I do? I have so much I want to touch upon and, and talk about that you skated over a couple of things that we're going to go back to. But I just want to say, you know, a shout out to Kicker for giving you what they've given you, because to have that kind of mentoring and examples, and you mentioned slow to anger in a time where our earth seems to just implode at the simplest mm. thing, that is gold to work for people like that. So shout yes. out mm -hmm. to uh, Steve and his team. And a couple of things you touched upon that I, I want to ask you about, because I, I do want to get it into your company, Audio Sigma and Pod Mobile. But there's so much here to, to chat about. We're going to try and, and <laughs> get it in before we say goodbye. I just have to, if you could speak to a moment, because you mentioned being a musician, and I was going to ask you, you know, given that you were raised in a geographic location where music is just infused into your culture, 
how much of a culture shock was it moving into Oklahoma? But since you said you do play, mm-hmm. have you found your niche of music and musicians to play with? Do you, you have no idea. Like, literally, like, I can't make this up. I don't have enough time to play with all the people that I need to play with. Really? Uh, yeah. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> For real. Uh, but, you know, to answer your question, I don't know what was, where did that come from? But as young as 12 years old, I was really into American music and and blues and like rocks rock from the sixties and the seventies, like Joe Cocker, James Joplin, you know, Peter Frampton, and there was something about that music that really moved my soul. And no one in my family were interested in that sort of music, but I was. And matter of fact, in my family, we don't have engineers or musicians. Really, it's it oh, was that's weird. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, no you got kidding. both. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Like sometimes I, 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 you know, it was kind of weird to make, try to make small talk with my family because we didn't have much common ground. Generally today, I think that's kind of for the best because, you know, I'm here and I'm going to create my own family. Always loved music. When my mom was like vacuuming the apartment, I would, you know, catch the pitch of the vacuum and start doing like voice and then the voice one octave up, one octave down. And <laughs> really? like, I don't know. Like I just knew that stuff. <laughs> Not to the vacuum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, like, and then singing. Okay, and, lay and, lay your best Hoover on me. <laughs> oh no, no, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, I always had a good ear, and then I was interested in electronics since the age of four, and then at 12 years old, I started playing the guitar because I wanted to make friends in school. And then, <laughs> oh yeah, like, if a dude can play a guitar, all oh, the chicks my goodness. like them. Yeah. Yep. And t- let me tell you, it, it paid off. Yeah. <laughs> it continues okay. to pay off. You know, learn to get Playing guitar. with benefits. Yes. Well, that too, yeah. At the age of 16 to 18, I really became very social, but it wasn't easy before that. So music basically was always in me. And then once I started playing, I basically took everything that I could do with electronics and transferred to um, audio. So instead of building a remote controlled car, you know, build a little amplifier, a little speaker that I could take with me to school and bring in, in my backpack. So my backpack played music, <laughs> you know, that's, it, it was, oh it my was gosh. Hilarious. Yeah. No kidding. You we're literally an inventor and entrepreneur in high school. I mean, you already I have that weird. brain. It's in you. I mean, that's why you had to birth it. That's why you were living the way you were living because it was who you were and are. Yes. Yes. I never, never lost it. I think many people are, if you look at kids, like how they negotiate, like when they have toys, Hey, I'm going to give you this one. And then you give me two of that. Oh no, 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 no. That's not a good enough bargain. Okay. I'll give you three of those. And then you give me that. And then I'll give you the candy too. Okay. That's fine. They do that stuff. Just naturally. Naturally. Sure. Right. You know, if you look at even animals, like they're curious, they're just curious. Like I had a bird just needed to look at everything at the whole, like, you know, it was just like annoying even. But, you know, curiosity and bargaining and negotiating, that's just normal. I guess because I was terrible at, in school and, and never went to college and didn't go like the whole full path, that stuff, you know, it wasn't knocked out of me. Uh, I guess many people that say, oh, I could never be an entrepreneur. They might be like, you know, maybe they could have been. But, you know, throughout their lives, they got that so mitigated, so put in the in the back burner that they lost touch with it. There are a lot more people that could be entrepreneurs that just don't think so, but they could be because it wasn't them in the first place. I want to touch on something that you said about schooling, formal Mm -hmm. schooling, that it's frowned upon if you don't have it until you become successful. And then Fernando's a genius. Do you know that he wasn't traditionally schooled? He doesn't have a degree, but look at what he's done with his life. He's a renaissance man. It's applauded when you are able to turn that into something that people can relate Mm -hmm. to. If you don't mind, I'd love if we could chat about your very humorous, yet very vulnerable Pecha Kucha presentation. And for those who aren't aware of what that is, maybe you could just speak to that for a moment. The word being a Japanese word meaning chit chat, but maybe you can explain what those presentations are. But I want to ask you about a couple of things that you mentioned during that presentation. So tell us briefly what that is and how that came about for you. Pecha Kucha is, um, is a very interesting format that people present a story. Could be a story of their lives, could be a different story. But if I'm not mistaken, it's um, 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. So it goes by in six minutes. 
and each slide will be part of your storytelling. And then I put together the Pecha Kucha presentation of basically how I started off in my bedroom doing all those crazy, you know, circuit things that were really it was uh, amazing. What an rough amazing at the time. presentation. Yeah. <laughs> During your presentation, and and you've mentioned it here, that about being self-educated and you taught mm -hmm. yourself English, which is remarkable. You've taught yourself circuit designing and coding and mm -hmm. even music. Yeah. And to quote, you also said you learned quite a bit about human behavior along the way. And you said that these were required lessons because at some point you would either learn these skills or be stuck in circumstances you didn't appreciate. And mm -hmm. would you mind sharing what that circumstance or circumstances were that you were referring to when you said that? Absolutely. Uh, as far as skills, like objective stuff goes, for example, when I got the job opportunity in Mississippi, I would only use a set of skills. Remember the DSP thing that we talked about briefly? Mm -hmm. That was yeah. this amazing technology, the little chip that does everything. I had no knowledge whatsoever about that. So when I was offered a job, I had to work with my existing skills, but I was made aware at the same time, because I visited this company that is on the cutting edge of things, PV Electronics, I was made aware, like almost shockingly, that this DSP thing was basically the, the new way of doing things. And basically I was already obsolete, didn't even realize it. So uh -huh. I kind of freaked out for the moment. Yeah. So if, had I taken the job, the ceiling would be, the roof would be over my head. Like, that's it. You know, you don't get farther from here. Right. And I kind of freaked out a little bit. And so that's one example of how limiting it would have been to not learn this DSP thing. And guess what? It's used on a lot of things that I do for Kicker. Big part of the reason they hired me was for that. It's used in the pod mobile. It's used on, on a lot of things that I will design still for Audio Sigma. So it's just like a useful thing and skills do translate into results in life. And uh, as a result, honestly, like I really like here. And by the time I, I took this job opportunity, I had more job opportunities to choose from. And ev even there, I say I can quit Kicker and still be really desired to work elsewhere. Matter of fact, even Google reached to me and um, I said no to them because I was not interested in having another job. I'm interested in having my company. I want to create jobs and getting another job would just throw off things and just really no, make no sense, though the paying would be higher. Also, it sounds mm -hmm. like you've got a really, really sweet situation of someone who supports your endeavors and your growth and, and actually mm -hmm. grooming you to kick you out of the nest to run your own company. And I do want to Talk yeah. about Audio Sigma. Before Please. I do that, mm -hmm. though, you mentioned also in the presentation that you play with, and, I, and I've heard this quote before, but the way you mm -hmm. said it, I want—I was wondering what you meant about it, what you meant by saying, you said you play with the cards you have, not the ones you don't. Mm -hmm. And given that you are a creative, a dreamer, mm -hmm. a creative dreamer, if you will, what does that mean for you? It, it does you no good whatsoever to uh, say, oh, I can't do this. I could resent that I don't have a specific ability, say playing, you know, basketball really well. That's not a card I was given. It's just not my gift. So when you know your limitations, if you need that, like you look for help or you will find a way to work with what you have and not with what you don't have. Got and it. Okay. So there are two sides to this. Like when you don't have a certain tool, like in your toolbox, your cards, right? You don't have something. You have to make a decision. You have to really look what it looks like in the future to have that and to not have it. And what's the cost to have it if it's at all possible. You know what I mean? So if it's basketball playing, it's not possible because I'm not tall enough. Now, in that case was the DSP thing, right? That we've just mentioned. It was a high cost of acquisition of that skill. It was unbelievably hard, but it was very much worthwhile. So I made a decision to earn that card, so to speak. But in that Pecha Kucha presentation, when I said that, I meant I don't have college. I was kind of trapped in that situation in Brazil, which doesn't have great access to a lot of things education wise. So I knew my cards and I played them, you know, and I made that video with the cards that I could play and play really well. And, you know, and that opened the doors. So what I, what I mean is that it's not worth to dwell on and suffer because you don't have this and you don't have that, honestly. And that's some victim mentality that doesn't help anyone. So we all can do something with the cards that we are dealt. 
But if it's a car that you can't have, don't dwell on that. Just make a plan with the cars that you have. I really appreciate you clarifying that because I thought, here's a man who is truly a creative dreamer and a very, very, very hard worker and exceptional work ethic. That's a given by what you shared and by everything that you've done and how you... <laughs> how you managed to get to the States and have the job that you have. I want to talk about your company, Audio Sigma, and the Pod Mobile. Do, 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 because if I had it, my life would have worked so much easier before <laughs> our interview. So The issue was the software, though. I, I mean, know, I, was just I, know but you, I know, but hey. Look, I'm trying to sell for you. Shh. We'll, we'll keep that comment out. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, that's, you're, that's you're welcome. <laughs> that's so, welcome and helpful. So what was your inspiration for building the Pod Mobile, And how do you balance that with the work you're doing for Kicker, especially when you told me how much you're doing with them? Balance. Oof. Well, I struggle with that. You know, the whole experience of coming to the U.S. and learning about skills to get your life in order inspired me to write a book. And I, I love writing. Uh, I, I absolutely love writing. Like, honestly, I could, I could do that for a living. But I'm a better engineer than a writer, I think. But with that said, I wrote it because I also wanted to process and compile all these things. And when you write things as if you were teaching someone, you find holes in your logic. And then it's very helpful for, for your own learning when you're you know, basically teaching. Yeah, so that's so interesting. Yeah, no, and I'm right. glad you're you're starting to talk about Jumpstart because that, that was going to be my next question. But please, have there's a it. twist on that plot, though. Um, okay. So I wrote the Jumpstart, and I was really proud of it. And then I wanted to record the audio book for it. Basically, I I needed an audio interface that would meet the Audible ACX requirements, and one of which was a noise floor of at least minus 60 decibels, which is, you know, not super hard to obtain, but the audio interface I had wouldn't do it. Little research I did, and I couldn't find anything that really inspired confidence for me under $500. And yes, I could buy it, but I wasn't, you know, like... You're honestly, an engineer. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm not going to buy this $700 thing, you know? So I just made one. I made one for myself because it took me two or three weeks to have it done completely. A couple really of from concept yeah. to completion. That is Granted, phenomenal. That was nothing like the one I have for sale now. You know, it was much rougher, but it was for my own use. So what I needed was something that was very portable. I was going to originally have it with only one channel, but then I figured, what if I need to have a conversation with someone about this book? So then I just copy and pasted another channel there. <laughs> and, um, Kicker has this uh, acoustics room with that is kind of like a VO booth and really cool, super isolated. But if I were to record my audiobook there, I would have to go in and out there fairly quickly. At the end of the day when nobody's working and I probably would be tired at that point. So I didn't want to deal with any mess like, you know, wire and installation and things like that. So I needed it to run from my phone. So then I designed it to run from my phone as well. And then, then I had this thing. And Jeff, one of my best friends, he saw it. He loved it. And then a couple of weeks later, he goes, hey, I sold one. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Seriously. So he just, he took your, yeah. what was it a prototype at the time or was it a finished product? It was an ugly prototype. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was insulting ugly. But anyhow, he, he said, oh you God. know, I sold one for my to my friend. I'm like, well, bro, what, what, what are you talking about? Anyhow, he, he did it. And then I'm like, there's no way that I'm just giving something like this to your friend. So then I redesigned it to look prettier. And it is. You know, it's, I, it's, I, very, it's very sexy if, if a piece of equipment can be sexy. It actually it, <laughs> awesome to hear. It, because it, it, really, it I worked is. with what I have. You know, like, honestly, um, I was concerned I'm about... I'm too sexy for this interface. Too... <laughs> <laughs> so, and can, know... I, can I just go back for just a second, Fernando? Yeah. I just want to mm -hmm. say, you mentioned ACX, and that is Audiobook Creation Exchange. It's a marketplace for... Mm -hmm audiobook narrators to market themselves and to get work. So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone listening mm -hmm. who wasn't familiar with that. Oh, yeah. So he sold one and then I basically made it prettier because, you know, um, the, I, I'm that kind of person. If somebody's buying my things, it needs to be presentable and it needs to be good. So I did that. And um, and then, you know, it was, I think that was like March. And, and then, you know, 
what do you know? I do some research and then, okay, One Voice Dallas, I can drive there. It's like only four hour drive. Well, I went to One Voice and I went there, you know, with um, basically five prototypes, no box, no cables, no warranty. Really? You didn't even have, you didn't have a box? Was, put the stuff in the trunk of my car, drove there and that was it. And, and, you know, I had microphones and stuff to show people. And I was, you know, basically walking around with that thing in my hands and like, hey, you know, you do voiceover. No, no, I just, uh, I make this audio interface. Oh, okay. Can I, can I see it? Oh, oh, wow. You know, like, I was like, really? And I'm thinking in my head, for real, man? Like, you like this? You know, like, like so insecure. That is so um, funny. Wait a minute. You <laughs> you create this design, you manufacture uh-huh. it, you drive all the, and by the way, One Voice is a voiceover conference in Dallas. But wait a minute. So you show up to sell it, but people like it and you, you're you dealing with like imposter syndrome, it sounds like. Yeah. I'm my, I am my worst critique. When I got this this job at Kicker, I was also like feeling like that, you know, it's been seven years. I have, ha, haven't been fired yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's working out. It's okay. I think, okay. I think they're, they're, they're okay <laughs> with my work. But anyhow, I went there and people, people loved it. And, you know, like, honestly, people just freaking loved it. Like, Did you, you know, sell them all? I did. Can you believe that? <gasps> yes! like, the, the trip didn't cost me anything. Actually, I made some money. I was like, whoa, man. Like, really? Like, Are you sure friend- you want to buy this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm also like, asking the question. And I'm like, right. hey, if you have any problems, just let me know. Here's my phone number. And, you know, like, really, like, I can't imagine, like, somebody not being happy with this. And, like, And, you know, I thank the Lord for the, the good people I've met, you know, because it's all about if you sell to the wrong person at the wrong time, you toast. Yes, so, for yes, example, yes. Andrew, you know, it wasn't perfect, you know, and now it's super perfect. Um, so buy one. Just kidding. It's, it's, it's quite good. Fernando, really, I'm working on that. Now. I'm working on that. But but you did tell me. And this <laughs> fake is, until this you is, make it like faking confidence I, right now. I know. This, 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 <laughs> this is a side note, though, a sidebar, I guess. Uh, you did uh-huh. tell me that you're working on a different model that you felt yeah. was more applicable to my needs. So we're going to chat about 100%. that for a yeah. moment. We have oh, so much you, to you, still get into our conversation. You are going to love that thing and carry everywhere. I okay, so what is that. the right? You you mentioned what the current model is. What is the update? What are you what? Or maybe it's not an update. Maybe it's an it's an addition to the one that you currently have. You're doing a second Pod Mobile. Is that have, correct? I will have three. Maybe the third one will replace the mini one. But I have the Pod Mobile with two channels, more targeted for podcasting than voiceover. I see. But okay. the voice voiceover people love it because it's so quiet like you know you can get a minus 75 decibel background noise and that is remarkable and that's what's most important yeah that's high dollar thing but it's you know it's so easy to use and it's very affordable so you know jody for example she loves it andrew loves it jody krangle she's a friend of ours is in podcasting and voiceover she's been on my show as well so yeah i just wanted to, to clarify that's who we were speaking about Right. So people really love it, both on the podcasting world and and voiceover world. But I made a small one like that is so small. That is absolutely ridiculous. I got like a bar soap, got out of the box and put the interface inside the box. It was just really so small. It's just nuts. (laughs) And it's got the same performance, you know. Are you serious? Wait a minute. Not kidding you. It was just crazy. So it's It's the size of a bar of soap. Yeah. A small bar soap. Yeah. Not a small bar of soap, not like the hotel yeah, size bar. Yeah, this is your computer mouse. No, so, no, no. So okay. Bigger than that. Yeah. Um, really? Just, yeah, so I take it it's one channel. It's then. like the Dove, Dove thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe anyhow, maybe Dove can sponsor uh, Pod Mobile too. Maybe yeah, you know, maybe they can supply the boxes. You know, since but, your first but, five didn't have boxes, so maybe my, you could... my look. <laughs> This interface is so small and the sound is huge. Like it will drive your headphones to explosion. Basically. Serious? Now, is it one channel or is it yeah. still? It is. Okay. One channel. Well, then I had done that and people fell in love emotionally with it. I think the, the, the pod mobile was still the better uh, logical choice, but people saw that thing and just, oh my God, you know, like there's such an emotion uh, factor with the sound of it and the size of it. It's just so unbelievable to see that it's so small and sounds so big. Then they said, hey, you know, a mute button would be great. A high pass filter, you know, anti plosive would be amazing. So I did that. So it grew just a little bit more and it's got the mute button, it's got the high pass filter. What else? Yeah, and it's got a defeatable um, phantom power as well. So I don't know if that's really an addition, but it's there. I think, um, I think everyone needs to have both. 
I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, podcasting I, 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 and voice I will cover. always be a proponent of that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, all three of them. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm actually uh, kidding because I think it's awesome when somebody buys something and they can use it and use it and use yes. it and use it and go like, oh my God, this was so worth it. I've always loved doing more with less. And that's why I kick it. I, I thrive because it's consumer electronics and we're not the fanciest brand, but my goodness, our stuff is good. And, it's worth and that's money. what matters, and, though, really. Yeah, I mean, right. It, at the end of the day, if you have something that's absolutely got all the bells and whistles and you bring it home and it's like three of them work out of 20, what's the point? The super fancy stuff never appeals to me. So mm -hmm. this model, it's going to be amazing for VO. I have prototypes coming soon. And of course, the first one is not going to be perfect, but maybe in a month I will have something that is like awesome and ready to buy. That's what um, I was going to ask you when that can yeah, be on the market. Nothing has been released officially, but it has been leaked. Really, I just sent to a gentleman and he posted on Facebook. I was like, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right time. No, don't do <laughs> yeah, that yet. But, you know, it's, I think in, at the end of the day, it's good. And that's one of the, those things like I learned to not control life, which maybe is a good segue into the, the whole results thing and the twist about that book, The Jumpstart. Here's the twist. I pulled it from the market. I went to go purchase a copy after mm -hmm. hearing about it, and it's not available. So please mm -hmm. do tell. Why did you pull it from the market? Here's what happened. And this is like the way I believe it. And I'm not saying this is the right way. I would never try to uh, persuade anybody to think the way I'm thinking now. But here's what I learned. And unless proven otherwise, probably would be the way I conduct my life. I've always been result driven. I've always created plans for everything. And to be honest, I still do because there's a very good side to that. So if you're going to self-help, it's very prescriptive and it's very helpful indeed with things like this is how you put your finances in order. This is how you should make your bed in the morning, you should go to the gym and not eat junk. So all these are like a super practical things and they do create good results. The thing that I didn't have a discernment about was that results are one thing and fruits are another. In my concept, my, my thinking, naive, I'd say, uh, at the time was fruits are an accumulation of go good results. And you know, that will fall short many times, especially when it involves other people, especially in matters of life and love. And you know, I give you an example that is very easy to understand. For example, result is lowering your cholesterol. So, okay, let's lower the cholesterol. What is the fruit that one might be looking for, most likely is looking for when they lower their cholesterol, is to live long and live healthy. But those things, have you seen those people that, you know, super healthy, eat right, and next thing you know, boom, something right. happened to them. Mm -hmm. And other people, they do everything wrong. And then and they, they live, live to 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. You know, I had to come to terms with this, that results, just results and, and whatever I can do and emphasis in the do. I cannot control that. You know, I can't, I'm not God. I cannot make it happen out of my own willpower. So loving marriage is a fruit that I look for. Longevity would be amazing. Be prosperous in business, which has been my day one thing, right? Like that's how I started. I've been an entrepreneur longer than I've been an employee. And I have this absolute necessity to become an employer. I want that very much. So things like that. And uh, this whole realization came after a very difficult time. It was the hardest, uh, the most grueling emotional pain. It was really the worst in my life. And that's when I surrendered. Surrendered is, is like surrender the idea that I can control my destiny 100%. And there's no such thing as what God wants. And really today I, I can look back and, and see that he had my back the whole time. He protected me. He gave me guardrails. But I think my work wasn't fruitful in the sense of fruits, as well as relationships weren't either. Not because it was a lack of effort or lack of skill or lack of the personal realm of, you know, being attractive or saying the right things or whatever. It was that I was basically not giving any consideration to what would be the will of God. And if there's such thing, and I truly believe there is, it's like a very strong wind that blows in one direction. And uh, you might be amazing and skilled and all that. And if you're trying to go against that wind, it's not going to be very fruitful. And if you're going with that wind on your back instead of being a headwind, it might just be very fruitful. One thing that really is shocking, which contrasts 
absurdly with my previous approach to life is Steve, the owner of Kicker. He didn't start this thing to be rich. He didn't set a bunch of goals. He didn't have a perfect plan. But he did consider, yes, what is the will of God? What What is it? And he's been devoted in that sense, 100%. Like he's a very Christian man. And things worked out amazingly for him. It's not because he was a business expert and a relationship guru and yet successful. And then I look at myself and I'm like, oh, my God. Like I worked the last 15 years what a person would work in 40 years. And yet I came to the U.S. at 28 years old with $200. And then at 30, I had a net worth of probably like 10 grand. And, you know, like, what the heck? And so I had to take a hard look at these things. So today I, I, I still believe believe in results and, and goals. I, I like to set goals. I really like to have direction. I like to wake up in the morning and, and know exactly what I'm going to do. But it's not the whole story. That's what I'm saying. And the Jumpstart book, like most uh, self-help books, ends there. And the issue with that is, I think, short-sighted. I think... In self-help, you have an issue that if you're doing amazing, if you're doing great, like say, for example, you managed to fulfill your goal to you know make a million dollars in five years, for example, you can have a lot of pride. Oh my God, I'm amazing. Even if you don't say it, if you, mm-hmm. even if you act out humbly, you can be like, oh my God, I am amazing. So you're kind of your own God, so to speak, right? And I don't think that's good. I don't think anyone appreciates that. And then when you fail, you think I suck. So either it's pride or shame it doesn't give you stability. So that's kind of how I live. I was really proud about this and really ashamed about that. And, and you know, it was kind of like this ups and downs. And generally life is, is hard. And therefore, usually it's more downs than ups. So the self-help can be bad in that sense. And sometimes even when things look great on the surface, like, oh, you know, this person has got their house in perfect order, uh, a nice car, six-pack abs. You don't know what's going on inside them. You don't know if they have any peace. You don't know if now they're hostage to all these things and being quite unhappy, but not telling anyone, even though the Instagram photos are amazing. Oh, sure. Yeah, because you can curate a presence. Right. In fact, there is a a man who recently, and he was very big in, quote, the influencer world, and he had a beautiful life. And unfortunately, it does seem like his demise was from an overdose, and he was very young. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Yeah. And I don't want to say his name because there's a lot of people who would know who he was, but I was saddened for him because I had followed him for a little while and he seemed like a really good man. And it was very sad to read about that. But I just want to clarify because we're we're wrapping up here is Mm -hmm. you felt because it just stopped at more of the tools of self-help versus giving a spiritual weight to it that you felt like you had to pull it from being available. Is that right? Yeah, I was uncomfortable with that because um, if one reads it, and that's not the the exception, like many self-help books would be like that. They can be really obsessed with those methods and and miss out on, you know, what's God's will for their lives and their purpose and things like that. And the other thing is, I don't like the idea of being a guru-esque kind of person at all. I don't want that. You know, I'm I'm happy to mentor and help someone any way I can, but I don't want to be anybody's idol, so to speak. And because I I felt like things that weren't complete truths or or sometimes were just wrong, like, for example, when I talk about work ethic, I say a truth like work ethic never gets obsolete. And that's absolutely true. But also I say, you know what, work hard for yourself, not for anyone else. Even if your job sucks, work hard for yourself. So you're preparing yourself for for the battles and stuff. And that's great. But honestly, like what I believe today, and I know this is a major shift and not many people will agree with that, but I think we need to work hard for God. He's the one that gave us our lives and our time here. So I don't even believe that my time here is my time. Because I didn't make that time. I didn't make my own life. Neither my parents did. They were just the means to that end. Yeah, things really shifted very hard for me after that difficult time in my life. And I have to say, that was truly a blessing that at least I came to to Christ at the age of 35 and not 55. Because I look even at my dad's life, for instance, and I say, you know, man, if you read the word, your life would have been a lot better and different and you'd be much better off and not the sad, broken person. 
I think you know I'm a God chick and you're a God dude. So this is a safe space to talk about it because one of the reasons I started from fear to hope is to get out of the place of fear that can be debilitating Mm -hmm. and can take us down and stop us from, you mentioned fruits as in the harvest of our, of our labor. We don't really talk about that in society as far as what our fruits. What We don't talk about it. We talk about it in different ways. We talk about it in very secular worldly ways, but gosh, there's so much more I wanted to cover, but I, I, you know, <laughs> I, a couple of the questions you've already answered. Uh, I get where your hope comes from. I get where your joy comes from. I get what sets you on fire, What where your passion's at. But I do have a key question. Yes. And that is, if there was a soundtrack to your life, what would be on it and why? Oh, my God. That's a hard question because eh, I can think of so many songs. It could even be a song that's that's applicable to this time in your life. It doesn't even have to be an entire soundtrack. That's a great question. Uh, Reckless Love, I think it would be a, a great song that could really resonate with that. How like he he protected me. He loved me when I didn't love him back. And he really loved me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Please mm. share with our listeners who that's by. And feel free to hum Let me a few Google. bars. <laughs> Corey Asbury. Yeah. Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. So, Fernando, yes. in closing, and I'll have it in the show notes how folks can get a hold of you, but I'd like to share something else that you said at your Pechacachu presentation. Mm-hmm. That is to be a dreamer and a doer. Mm-hmm. You mentioned be a dreamer and a doer. And I'd say that you are doing a fine job covering both of these aspirations, Fernando. And (laughs) I wish you continued success and manifestation of your dreams. And I know that that word might, given the conversation we just had, might be a little Mm -hmm. weird, but meaning your work bearing fruit, your work would bear fruit, your dreams would bear fruit. And I just want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. That was an amazing time. I really thank you for you having had me on your podcast. You are welcome back anytime. I have a feeling that you're going to be having your brick and mortar sooner than maybe you had even anticipated. But as you say, timing is everything. I can picture it really clearly, the things that I will do in it for people to to do really great there and to be a proponent of the health of their families and all. Like That is amazing. Um, that's that's yeah. an amazing aspiration to just yeah. have the well-being of other people in mind. Fernando, mm-hmm. thank you so mm-hmm. very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for this. It's amazing. And uh, I don't take any of this for granted. And I just want to thank you again for your generosity with your time. You're welcome. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips and so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song, Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23:18. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together with our differences Together we are bolder, braver, stronger